Today, we're going to talk about the scientific method, which is a logical process that all scientists go through when they do a research project. You'll have to use the scientific method when you design a science fair experiment. We'll go over the method by talking in detail about one of Ms. Burke's experiments that she's doing at UC Irvine. So what is the scientific method? Well, before you can even think of starting an experiment, first you need to come up with an original question. Then you need to decide on the right model to address your question with. In biology experiments, the model is usually a living thing, like a plant or an animal. Once you've decided on an appropriate model, you need to come up with a hypothesis, which is a prediction or possible answer to your original question. The important thing to remember about a hypothesis is that it has to be testable. You can then test your hypothesis using an experiment. When designing an experiment, it's important to keep certain things in mind such as the variables you manipulate and the variables that you expect to respond. You also need to be careful to standardize any other variables that might affect the outcome of your experiment. Your experiment should also use a control treatment and replication. After you collect the data from your experiment, you'll need to interpret your results using tables and graphs and decide if they support your hypothesis or not. Then, you'll need to communicate your conclusions to your peers using reports or posters. So let's talk about how real scientists implement this method. We are at the University of California Irvine and we're going to take a peek inside the lab where Ms. Burke works. This lab belongs to Dr. Michael Rose who is a famous scientist who studies the biology of aging. He has been a professor at UC Irvine for about 20 years and he's published a lot of research on this topic. But he doesn't do it alone. The people working here are student scientists who help Ms. Burke with her experiment. They come in every day and help record data. But what are they recording? Let's talk about the scientific method behind this experiment. The original question being asked is, do groups of organisms that reproduce when they are older live longer than groups of organisms that reproduce younger? This might sound confusing, but it really isn't. Basically, we just want to know if the age when individuals reproduce is related to how long that individual lives. Think of it this way. The average age at which a human female reproduces is approximately 20. This means that the generation time of humans is about 20 years. The average lifespan of humans is about 75 years. What would happen if human generation time were longer? What if the average human female reproduced at age 30 instead of age 20? Our thinking is that if this were true, humans would live longer on average. This is because humans would have to stay healthier for a longer period of time before they could pass their genes on to the next generation. So we have our question, but obviously we can't test this in humans. Instead, we need to find an organism that is perfectly suited to address our question. So it needs to be one that is easy to take care of in the lab. Also, since we want to measure the lifespan of individuals, we should pick an organism that doesn't live very long. What should we use? Fruit flies, of course! Remember, the scientific name for fruit flies is Drosophila. Fruit flies have a short generation time of only 14 days. In that period of time, they can develop from an egg into an adult capable of reproducing. They are very small, so it is easy to keep huge numbers of them in the laboratory. It's also very easy to handle flies because you can keep them from flying using anesthetic and move them around with paintbrushes. There is also a huge amount of scientific information available about fruit flies. Scientists have mapped the entire genome of Drosophila, which means that they know the DNA sequence of every single gene in fruit fly DNA. This is all public information available to researchers. There are websites like this one called Flybase that will tell you all published information about every single fruit fly gene. Okay, so now we have our question and we know that we're going to use fruit flies to answer it. So now it's time to come up with a testable hypothesis. Remember, a hypothesis is a possible answer to your research question. In this experiment, our hypothesis is that groups of flies that reproduce at old ages will live longer than groups of flies that reproduce when they are younger. So how are we going to test our hypothesis? 
Well, we have been keeping fruit flies on specific generation schedules for almost two years preparing for this experiment. We actually have seven experimental populations and we control the age at which the flies are allowed to reproduce in each one. So each population has undergone a different experimental treatment. We expect that the population that reproduces at the youngest age, population A, will have the shortest lifespan. We expect that population B to live longer than population A, and so on. And if Finally, we expect population G, which has the longest generation time, to also have the longest lifespan. And remember how I told you that fruit flies normally have a generation time of 14 days? Well, we made sure to add a population D that has a 14 day generation time so that it would be our control. That means that it did not undergo any experimental treatment at all. All the other populations did. We are going to put flies from each population into clear cages. Each cage will correspond to a different experimental treatment, A through G. Then we will monitor these cages and record data from them every day. But this isn't all. We're actually going to monitor multiple cages for each population every day. By using several cages instead of just one per population, we're using what's called replication. Replication is really important in experiments for two reasons. First of all, it acts like a backup in case something unexpected happens to one cage, we still have another one to observe. Second, it can add to your confidence about your results. If we observe the same result multiple times, it increases the probability that we are observing something that's actually true. We are going to use five replicates for each population, and here's one of our student scientists pointing out the replicates. Each stack of five cages corresponds to a different population, and each cage has 1,000 fruit flies in it. Since we have seven populations total and five cages per population, our entire experiment consists of 35 cages. That's 35,000 flies to count. When you're doing an experiment, it's really important to think about what kinds of variables might affect your results. We make sure that all cages experience the same temperature and that the lighting also stays the same. We also are careful to make the food exactly the same for all the flies. We cook one big batch and pour it into small dishes that we feed each cage. By standardizing the variables of temperature, light, and food, we are hoping that the only variable that actually affects the fly's lifespan is what we are manipulating, which is generation time. So let's review. In our experiment, we've covered these three most important aspects of experimental design. The variable we are manipulating is generation time, and the variable we expect to respond is lifespan. We've also standardized any other variables that might affect the outcome, such as food, temperature, and light. We have a control population that has not experienced any experimental treatment. And finally, we have replicated our experiment by using many flies per cage and by using many cages per population. So now, all that's left to do is to collect the data. Every day, student scientists will come in and record the number of flies that have died in each cage. They will do this until every single fly has died in every single cage. This is a lot of work. It requires the cooperation of many scientists working together to make sure that all the data is recorded and collected in an organized way. Once all the data are in, we will need to calculate the average time it took for a fly from each population to die. Once we have this information, we can easily organize our data into a graph. Here's an example of what our graph will look like if we were right about our hypothesis. We would expect the populations with the shortest generation times, such as population A, to also live the shortest, and the populations with the longest generation times, such as population G, to live the longest. Once we have this graph, we can use it to generate conclusions. If it looks like lifespan increases with generation time, then we will say that we have found evidence in support of our hypothesis. If it does not look like lifespan depends on generation time, then we will say that our results did not support our hypothesis. We will then need to communicate and explain our experimental outcome. At the university level, this means publishing the results of experiments in scientific journals. For your science fair experiment, you will have to communicate your conclusions to your fellow students and teachers using a poster. So who are all these student scientists anyway? Let's meet one of them. This is Erica. She's been working in the lab for about two months now. Hi, my name is Erica Kancha. I'm currently a freshman bio-sci major here at UC Irvine. I am now sitting in Michael Rose's lab where we study aging using fruit flies. 
My interest in science and biology in particular started in the eighth grade when I had an exceptional science teacher who got me motivated to do well in science. I then went on to high school to take as many science classes as possible and my favorites were general biology and forensic science. Currently, I am very much interested in neurobiology, so as a potential neurobiologist, I hope to use the experience I get in the lab to go on to do research or study medicine. As a high school senior, I found the college high school transition to be very intimidating, but now, as a freshman in college, I found that the transition was a lot easier than expected. With tutoring services, as well as scholarships and assistance from other students available to you, especially for minorities, the transition's a lot easier, so there's no need for intimidation.